What can contemporary art do that reportage photography can't? And what does reportage photography, what is it weighted with that art tends not to be? You know, I struggled between these two poles, I suppose, of contemporary art and documentary photography. If you're representing human suffering, a lot of photographers don't want to get accused of aestheticizing that. Beauty, aesthetics are the sharpest tool in the box. And I believe that they can be used effectively to more adequately and more powerfully communicate complicated and difficult narratives. In 2014, there was more than a million people landing on the shores of Europe who were uh, claiming asylum, in other words, refugees. I discovered through a friend a thermal military-grade weapons technology, <laughs> which is a camera. So the camera is very unique and interesting and powerful in that it can image human body heat from 30 kilometers away or 18 miles. It was designed for, specifically for, long-range border enforcement, battlefield situational awareness, detecting, tracking and targeting insurgents, as well as search and rescue. We were using it against its intended purpose, filming, in other words, refugees coming across the sea uh, on boats or sometimes drowning, uh, dying of hypothermia. But I was doing it through, through a camera designed to keep these people out. I was trying to really touch upon the ambiguity of, of the subject and to provoke in the viewer a sense of their own, an uneasy sense of their own complicity. Film and photography are very different. The way I've used them has been almost counter-reactive to each other. The photographs are very, I suppose, passive, reflective. I mean, the video work. It's very visceral, very immersive, sometimes quite emotive, quite aggressive. After I graduated, I went off to Berlin. I'd been reading a lot about the Serbian-Croatian tensions of the mid-20th century. And of course, then in the 90s, it all broke out again. And I drove down to Bosnia. And I wanted to document the missing persons crisis. But I immediately began to struggle because I was, I was trying to document an absence. The subject is the missing people. You cannot put them in front of the lens. So really, I began to think about you know, the sort of limitations of documentary photography uh, at that very early age. I find that very interesting. I spent five years working in Congo when it began in early 2010. That was around the same time that Kodak had announced the discontinuation of Aerochrome, which is one of their more eccentric film stocks. And it represents the world in this, these bright hues of red and pink and fuchsia. And it's, it's extraordinary sort of way of seeing the world. And, but that film was originally designed as a, as a weapons technology in World War II. So the film has this tension in its history. And there's a specific aspect of wars in, and conflict in Eastern Congo, which I felt tallied with the film, that the scale of, of, those, of, of the conflict is so huge. But it's not really translating. The mass media wasn't really paying attention. It's unseen. And so I was interested in that, the fact that the film was able to, to see, to, to perceive an invisible spectrum of light, to reveal something that's hidden to the human eye. I suppose this was a way for me to, to, to mediate this situation, to try to understand it for myself. And I suppose I realized there was a potential to, on some level, um, communicate these tragic narratives to a wider audience.
kuva nyanza lenga